gracious Father, as we prepare now for our second service, Lord, let us take with us the inspiring faith that we had through our Sabbath school and to also be infused with a faithful practice of a daily study of the word. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. everybody happy Sabbath. Sabbath okay so we're gonna have the announcements right now Can we find them okay so today we're gonna be having potluck and everybody's invited and it's really good all the time so I would suggest you stay <laughs> and thank you everybody for your continued support of the food pantry and for the box we have out there for the Alameda school praise the Lord for that that just keeps staying full for everybody. Okay, let's see. A Wednesday night prayer meeting at 7 p.m. Um, I invite you to come and join everybody that comes to Bible study. I've recently started trying to come to, so hopefully the Lord keeps me going. <laughs> okay, let's see here. Needed male singers for choir in February. Please see Alyssa or Julie. And I know there's a lot of you here that have really good voices, so it would be nice to hear some male voices in the choir. Can't wait to hear it. Uh, let's see here. January 1st through the 31st, there was a 31-day vegan and vegetarian challenge, game changer. I hope it worked for all of you people that tried it. <laughs> let's see. Today, following potluck, there will be men and women's ministries, so I invite you to stay for that. It's really been a blessing for all the ladies that come, and from what I heard for the men as well. And tomorrow there's a Pathfinder meeting from 10.30 to 12.30. And on the 1st of February, there'll be a church board meeting at 5.45 p.m., and February 16th, sewing class from 9 to 11 a.m. And that sewing class is so awesome. I sewed my first, what do you call it, pillowcase. So it was fun. <laughs> so I look forward to seeing everybody there. God bless you. Thank you. Um, Joe, did we want to do the second reading on that? Yes. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Uh, last week, or last Sabbath, we had what, the first reading for Perla Ortiz and Diana Rael. Uh, this is our, our second one. So you are now members of Los Ranchos Company, and uh, we are so happy to have you. Uh, especially uh, Perla, you know that you've been here for a long time. Dan, not taking away anything from your mom, but Perla has been a gem for us in, the, in, in this church. So welcome, welcome to our family. You are now part of our family. Uh, before, we were like a, having an adopted uh, two ladies, two beautiful ladies, but now you are ours. So welcome, and after the services, you can uh, congratulate them and welcome them to our family. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joe. Let, let us say a prayer here. Dearly Father, we thank you for these two souls, Lord. We want, we want to know that uh, our hearts are filled with joy for them joining uh, this congregation, and they have been a blessing, yes, indeed, and they continue to be a blessing, Lord. Fill their lives with your
your spirit. Watch over, protect them, their families, and let the church know, let them know that the church cares and loves them, and that your son loves them, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. For those that don't know, this is Religious Liberty Offering Sabbath, okay? And there are uh, these pamphlets that are right there in the bookshelf as you come into the foyer there. And uh, please take one and read it. And if you're uh, inclined to make an offering for that, it's basically designed to pass it along. And, and it's uh, the target are the, uh, the main target uh, you can get the magazine yourself also, uh, but the main target is to share it with those that are establishing policies and making laws. Uh, as Because this is in January, most legislatures are gathering on uh, in January, such as the one in Santa Fe for the 30-day session. So you, if you are in touch with and, and can uh, think of whoever you'd like to send one of these to, perhaps one of your legislatures or a county commissioner or somebody that's in a policy-making role, that they would know uh, where uh, things are going in this world and where we stand. But it's very important that uh, religious liberty, which is under attack at this very moment and is growing, uh, that we would be able to witness through this process. So if you're interested, th these uh, little pamphlets are available right there around the corner on the bookshelf. We could open our hymns to hymn number 626. And if we could all please stand.
In 469, leaning on the everlasting arm. Hymn number 214, we have this hymn.
loving Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for bringing us all here together this morning. We just ask, Heavenly Father, as we move on upon this next part of our service, that your presence be with us, yours and all the angels that can fit in here, Heavenly Father. And we just thank you for this opportunity and this moment that we can learn more about you and your son, Jesus. We thank you and praise you and give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we give thanks. Amen. Amen. Scripture reading is Psalms 6930. I will praise the name of God with a song that will magnify him with thanksgiving. That is our scripture reading. The other thing that I would like to request from our families, we just had our 10-day prayer meeting. Actually, it's, we stayed 11 days. And we selected seven people from, from every person here that came. At one point, we had 32 people here, 33 the most, but we averaged about 22 people. Uh, what I'd like to propose, being that we had seven people, we have a long list of people that need prayer. For those people, and, and including the people that came here on, on the 10 days of prayer, I would like to propose that we take three people from this list, three people, three people, you know, from, from everybody, and if we have to come around and do the same thing, but in addition to the seven people that we had, that I had, I had seven, I'm going to add three more people from here. Ron, you had seven, add three people from here, and prayer helps. I, I, I have already seen three of my people, of my seven people. One of them was Andy, my cousin. Uh, the other one, Alex. The other one, Ray Chavez, back there. And there's still four that I'm praying for. I'm not praying for all of them, but there's still four that I have not seen. I don't know what the consequences as far or the results of the prayers are. are. So hopefully everything comes out, comes out well. So if, possi if possible, it's on. It's on. is it on? Yeah. No. Hello. Got it. Okay, so if everybody can take three people from here and pray for those people. I'd, uh, I'd really love it because it does help. And now uh, for our prayer, I'd like to have everybody have kneel down that can. If it goes, I can. We'll welcome back. Oh. 
all of our family, family church members and for those who are in need and that are not in our list. I thank you and praise you for our teachers here in the Toronto. They do a wonderful job with our children and youth. In, clo in closing, our speaker, Ray Chavez Jr. with the Holy Ghost, and let his words be your words that will be filled with the Holy Ghost Spirit with, and with the gifts of knowledge and wisdom so we can understand the scriptures better. Guide us straight and clear lines so we can do with you to your word. I pray this in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. By the way, there are two more people that want to transfer here, which is Adrian Maestas and Mercedes Maestas. So I'll update that in uh, to the conference and start the process. Brian, Brian. Brian. I'll take it back. I said it. Brian, thank you. Okay, now I'd like to call up Miss Marisa for a children's story. Can all the kids come up, please, too? Good morning, boys, boys and girls. Happy Sabbath. Okay, before we start, we're going to go pray. Who wants to pray? One, two, three. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for what you've done for us in this day. Amen. 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 Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for us to be at church. Thank you for us to be here with Jesus. Help us all to be in heaven. Thank you for us to learn about Jesus. Jesus Christ, Lord, amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. 
would be to heaven? Jesus. Jesus. Who else? God. Who else? The angels. The angels. You know that Jesus made angels. Many, many angels. Heaven was very happy place. So everyone is kind. They are obeying each other. They are being, res being respectful to each other. But until something very sad happened, one of the angels named Lucifer started telling a lie about Jesus. Some angels, do you, you heard that story? That's good that you heard this story. Very good. So until something very sad ha happened, one of the angels named Lucifer started telling lies about Jesus. Some angels believed those lies and even told them to other angels. Soon heaven wasn't happy anymore. Jesus asked Lucifer to stop telling lies. Did he stop? No. No, he kept telling lies. He wouldn't stop. Then Lucifer leave the heaven. He and his angels couldn't keep living there anymore. They were breaking the rules. You guys have rules in your house? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. What? It's like uh, no breaking glass. No breaking glass? <laughs> if you break the rules, what happens to you guys at home? You get in trouble. You get in trouble. So after Jesus, after that, Lucifer has a new name. Do you know that name? Satan. Satan. Satan was so angry when he had to leave. He had made a lot of trouble for Jesus in heaven. Now he wanted to hurt things in the new world Jesus made. So Jesus told Adam and Eve about Satan. So he warned them that Satan wanted them, wanted uh, say that Satan wanted them to obey him instead of Jesus. So Jesus warned them to be careful. So Jesus loved Adam and Eve, and he gave them many wonderful things. He gave them every tree in the garden to eat, except one. In, uh, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So Adam and Eve loved Jesus. They wanted to obey him because they don't want to die. But one day, Eve made a big mistake. She made a bad choices. Without thinking, she found herself close to the tree. And suddenly, she heard a beautiful voice. If you guys by yourself and you heard something, what are you going to do? Run away. Run away? I keep talking to it. You keep talking to it? <laughs> You're not going to scare it? No? You're so brave. So suddenly, she heard a beautiful voice. And it wasn't Jesus, and it wasn't Adam. And who is it? have run away the minute she heard this strange voice, but she didn't. She stopped to listen. A serpent, she saw a serpent, a very pretty serpent, a snake, talking to her. Eve had never talked to a serpent before, and she didn't know it, but Satan used, okay. used yes, and you want, you know what, the, you know that Satan lied? He said, you won't die if you eat the fruit. And he killed a piece of fruit that he and told Eve to take a bite. Did Eve take a bite? No. Yes. He took the fruit of her in, her in her hand. Then she took a bite. It was very good, she said. She ran to tell Adam. And she wanted to eat the fruit too. Adam knew that right away that Eve had done wrong. He knew that she would die, but he loved her so much. So what happened? Adam, Adam eat too, took a bite too. When he did, he disobeyed who? God. That's right. So at first, Adam and Eve thought they were happier, but soon they knew that they were not happy. Soon they were, they, they, um, they were not happy. And 
then, are, are we happy if we obey or if we disobey? No. No. What's going to happen again if we were to disobey? Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> what happened if we were to disobey at home? At school, if you don't listen to your teacher, if you, don't, if you make a lie and disobey teachers, what happens to you at school? You get in trouble. You get in trouble. That's right. So Jesus let Adam and Eve choose like he lets us choose. We can obey. Which one are you going to obey? What happens if you disobey? Who is sad? Jesus. Who? Jesus. Jesus is sad if you be disobey. If mommy said, Okay, when you go to school, you be good. Don't punch, don't lie, but then you still did it. Who is happy? Satan. Satan is happy. He's jumping. Because he's like, ooh, he is lying. Which one are you guys supposed to obey? Jesus. Jesus, that's right. We obey Jesus. Okay? So we can obey Jesus or we can obey Satan. You guys decide which one, but you guys are so lucky because <coughs> your parents, your foster parents, your grandparents teach you the right thing. Teach you what is in the Bible. So, yeah? so you guys are very lucky. You guys are still young and little. You guys already know what is right and what is wrong. So we have to obey. We have to follow the right thing. Okay? So Jesus wants us to be happy. Jesus wants you to be happy. Your mommy and your daddy, your grandparents want you to be happy too. So the rules Jesus made are good rules. Do you know what are the, what, how many God, uh, how many rules that God gave to us? That's the Ten Commandments. Ten. Ten. Isn't it? Are you, you think it's hard to follow them? Jesus made us good rules. Obeying them makes people happy. So are you learning to be happy by obeying? Yeah. Yes. So guys, kids, start today. I know you guys are already obeying and uh, listening to your parents. So continue to listen and obey your parents and also obey God's words. Okay? Okay, who wants to pray? Okay, you guys want to pray? Who want to pray? Jasmine, you want to pray, uh, Maggie? Okay, okay. Who wants to pray? Me. No? Okay. Then you guys have a small group of people. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for us being at church. Thank you for us being here so we can learn about Jesus. Help us to go to heaven. Help us to be good at home and at school wherever we go. Help us to listen to our foster parents or our, our mom and our dad. Help us to follow the Ten Commandments and honor our father and mother. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. 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 Special music. I, <laughs> special music. Sorry. <laughs> I'd like to invite Jana. Sorry. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
that was such a blessing. How beautiful that was. Okay, so now it's time for Tithe and Offering. Alan White says in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 526, the tithe was to be exclusively devoted to use of the Levites, the tribe that had been set apart for the service of the sanctuary. But this was by no means a limit of the contributions for religious purposes. The tabernacle, as afterward, the temple was erected wholly by free will offerings and to provide for necessary repairs and other expenses. From time to time, sin offerings and thank offerings were brought to God. Okay, so at this time, I'm gonna say a prayer and um, then we'll have the deacon and deaconess please stand. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, please bless this money and let it go to where you need it to go, Father especially to that 69% of the world that has not heard your word. Father, we ask that you bless it and send it forth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. It's wonderful to be here with you all here this morning, worshiping you on this wonderful Sabbath day. I was not sure I was going to be able to make it. As most of you know, we had several false alarms with Jessica, and it's been a day-by-day -day experience as she's almost ready to deliver the twins. To be honest, I almost called Alex this morning, but we were thankful we were able to come, and I'm thankful I'm able to be here. I'm really thankful that I'm able to share this message this morning because this has been something I've been wanting to speak about for two years. It's just the time, it didn't seem right, uh, but when I was asked to speak next, it was right there was the message that I had to speak, so I'm glad that I could bring it to you this morning. Now, usually we hear a sermon, we discuss the Bible and its depthness of Scripture, what God has to tell us. But Alan White says that sometimes there's good times to step away from that and talk about testimonies. Now, the ten testimonies that I would like to speak about this morning are not our, any of ours here in the sanctuary, but of other people from around the world in the past. And I thought this would be a great timing for this message because around the world in many churches, there are highly, highly heated debates about music in church, in its service, in its worship, and other things. So I would like to speak about hymns that we sing today in church. But tell the true stories of where those hymns came from. I believe sometimes... Because we sing these hymns and these songs over and over and over again every Sabbath or maybe every Wednesday night prayer meeting or any time we gather, sometimes we sing these hymns and we don't even know why they were made. We don't even know the message behind them. So I just want to share several stories behind some of the hymns that we normally sing for our worship services. 
So with that, let us go ahead and dive into prayer as we ask God for his guidance and his blessing at this time. Loving Heavenly Father, at this moment in time, we come to you and we ask for a blessing. A blessing of understanding and a blessing of knowing what these songs truly mean. We just pray, Heavenly Father, that your spirit be amongst us here, that it dwell with us so much, Heavenly Father, that we could feel it. And as we praise you through learning about song, that you can be glorified through all these things that we learn and we talk about. Bless us now and be with us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So one of the things that's constantly debated in our various church services, and I already brought up, but it's music. But most uh, importantly, what's being said is, why do we need to sing those same old hymns in church all the time? Is that not true? What do many people say? They're boring. That's old. I want new. Why do we constantly have to sing the same things all the time? There's a certain group who says, why can't we just sing new songs? A question I always ask, are new songs bad? I would say no, they are not bad. Are old songs bad? I would say, no, they are not bad. They are good songs, but they are also bad songs to have during worship service. But sometimes when many people come to me and say, why can't we sing new songs, which is mainly the youth, my answer to this is always this. Let's sing new songs. Great. Let's bring them to our worship service. Tell me a new song in which we could sing that does two things. It honors God in its message, and it honors God in its music. And we can play this new song, and we can be happy. I'm still waiting. For years, I've heard the same thing, I've given the same answer, and I'm still waiting. There are some great songs that are out there that really glorify God with the message. But the music is all wrong. There are great songs that glorify God with the music, but the lyrics and the message are all wrong. It's hard to find a song to where the two come together and create such a song that it makes you understand and feel as if you're in the presence of God himself. It's very rare these days. Now, I would like to share not only stories, but a scripture. Psalm 69 Verse 30, it says, I will praise the name of God with a song and I will magnify him with thanksgiving. I want you to remember this scripture. Every time you sing a song, remember this scripture. At the end of this message, I'm going to end with this scripture. I'll say it again. Psalm 69 verse 30, I will praise the name of God with what? With a song. So you can praise God with music. But I will magnify him with thanksgiving. Have you ever noticed that when we sing, there's not so much thanksgiving in the way we sing? Whether it be hymns, newer contemporary music, however it is, did you notice there's not much thanksgiving? Could it be the reason why some want new music? is because we sing these praises like we are at a funeral home. There's no thanksgiving in singing. There's no joy in singing. We sing it as we're in the presence of death rather than in the presence of a living almighty God. The book Pastoral Ministry in chapter 31 says this. Worship music should be cheerful. Amen. Amen but yet solemn. Those who make singing a part of the divine worship should select hymns with music appropriate to the occasion, Amen. not funeral notes, but cheerful yet solemn melodies. 
the voice can and should be modulated, softened, and subdued. Can we sing music that praises, glorifies God, at the same time being happy and joyful, yet solemn? I believe we can. But sometimes what do we try and do? We try to go to this extreme or this extreme rather than being in the center. And we argue about what side is better when either side is the ditch, the middle is where Jesus wants us to be. Could it be that people want the praise music of today's modern Sunday style worship is because when these people sing, they actually seem happy that they're singing these songs. Could it be the reason why people say we need these type of music is because they see joy. They see thanksgiving in these people who are singing these types of songs. Now, I will admit these types of songs are, and I have no problem with saying it, are deceptive in nature. But at the same time, those people that are singing it, at least they're happy showing praises to God even though they're singing the wrong style of music. Why can't God's people who profess to know scripture, who follow scripture, sing with the same attitude and glorify God through the proper music? Why can't we do that? Music has a great effect on people for good and for bad. But at times, God uses music in a special way to reach his people. He can bring out a song through tragic events. He can bring out a song through happy ones. He can even bring out great truth through music by people who are studying scripture. It doesn't have to be a happy or sad moment that these great uh, hymns that we know it come out of or these newer type musics, but it could be simple and just simply studying the word of God and God reveals to them a great, wonderful song that praises him. So I'm going to share some stories this morning with you. Found out, found, a, or they're published by a book called Amazing Grace. It's a devotional book. I would encourage you also, if you'd like to purchase this book, also look at our hymn book, part two. Does, it, does anybody have that in their library? If you ever look at our Seventh-day Adventist hymn book, part two, it's the stories behind our music and our hymns. It's a companion book. If you want to know why we sing these certain hymns in our church, get the companion book. The book I have here is a companion book, but it's not specifically only for Seventh-day Adventists. It's for all the most famous hymns in the world. So why do we use hymns in our worship? Are they appropriate? What's the message behind some of these popular hymns that we sing? Well, let's look at one. If you have a hymn book or if you have your digital hymn book, however may you, you have it, look at hymn 499. It's entitled, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Now this little book here gives a brief summary of how this, these hymns came about. It's not so much in detail, but it gives a brief understanding. Hymn number 499, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. How many of you like that hymn? Raise your hand. Amen, right? The, the title speaks for itself, right? Let's look at the backstory. It says, True friends love and accept us just as we are. They stay close to us, in good or in the bad, and is always ready to help in the time of need. Because the author of this hymn text found just a friend in the Lord, he decided to spend his entire life showing real friendship to others. Joseph Scriven wrote this hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Joseph Scriven had wealth, he had education, he had a devoted family and a pleasant life in his native Ireland, where he lived. Then unexpected tragedy entered. On the night before Screven's scheduled wedding, his fiancée drowned. In his deep sorrow, 
Joseph realized that he could find a solace and support that he needed only in his dearest friend, Jesus. Soon after his tragedy, Scriven dramatically changed his lifestyle. He left Ireland for Port Hope, Canada, determined to devote all of his extra time in being a friend and helper to others. He often gave away his clothing and possessions to those in need, and he worked without pay for anyone who needed his help. Scriven became known as the Good Samaritan of Port Hope. When Scriven's mother became ill in Ireland, he wrote a comforting letter for her, enclosing the words of his newly written poem. Which poem do you think that was? What a friend, what a friend we have in Jesus. With the prayer that these brief lines would remind her of a never-failing heavenly friend. Sometime later, when Joseph Scriven himself was very ill, a friend came to call on him, happened to see a copy of these words scribbled on a scratch paper near his bed. The friend read the lines with interest and asked, Who wrote these beautiful words? This was Scriven's reply. The Lord and I did it between us, was Scriven's reply. And those words that were written on the poem that gave his mom some hope in the coming of Christ, that gave him hope in a time of ill, is this. You can read in your hymnals. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to, in, to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrow share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge? Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise and forsake thee? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou will find what? A solace, A solace there. <laughs> Amongst the trial that his mother was going through, and eventually his, what was his message? God first. What a friend we have in Jesus. Whatever trial you have, whatever problem you're going through, what a friend we have in Jesus. There's meaning to these songs in which we sing every Sabbath or every time we gather. They're just not a song that someone thought of and thought, maybe I can make money off of it or maybe this will be famous. These songs were written and they were impacted. God used the tragedy or the, or the victories or any other aspects of these people's life to show people that God is faithful to you and me and that he will always be there. And this song shows us truly what a friend we have in Jesus. Amen? The next song we're going to talk about is hymn number 469. Him 469. I only have several of these stories. They're some of the most popular ones. Him 469. And what is that hymn? Leaning on the everlasting arms. Knowing that Jesus is our friend, but now knowing what? That we can lean on his everlasting arms. Listen to this story. When close friends or family turn to us for comfort in their grief following the loss of a loved one, often we find it difficult to express just the right words of consolation. How many of you have been through that situation where someone has suffered a tragic loss and you're there for them, but you just don't know what to say? That happens all the time. It happens to me more than I like it. I hate being in that situation. One day, successful author and businessman, a devout Presbyterian, Anthony J. Showalter, received sorrowful letters from two different friends. 
telling them, or excuse me, telling him that they're re of their recent bereavements. And sending messages of comfort to them, Mr. Showalter included a verse. Deuteronomy 33, verse 27, which I'll read here in a bit. And he concluded in his letters, the thought occurred to him that this verse would be a fine theme for a hymn. Almost spontaneously, he jotted down the words and music for the refrain of this soon-to-be favorite. Deuteronomy 33, verse 27, the first part where he got his inspiration after these events and reading these letters, says this. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. So a lot of these songs you'll find have references to what? Going back to scripture. It's just not about something someone thought, but it's about teaching a principle or teaching what scripture has to say. Feeling that he should have some assistance in completing a text based on this comforting verse of Deuteronomy 33, 27, Mr. Showalter asked his friend, Elisha Hoffman, a pastor and author of more than 2,000 gospel songs, to furnish the stanzas. The hymn then was published in 1887 in the Evangelical for Revival um, uh, Meetings Hymnal. It is not surprising that leaning on the everlasting arms with this assurance of God's steadfast care and guidance and the peace that is ours as we enjoy the Im intimacy of his fellowship had been another of the gospel song favorites enjoyed by all ages. Each day we need to relearn the truths of his word that we can lean on his everlasting arms. What is, how does the song go? What a fellowship. What a joy divine. Leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness. What a peace is mine. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Now no wonder why he would send Deuteronomy 33, 27 and why this song would be so impactful in his life as he read these two letters by these two different couples who were going through a traumatic loss. Because we definitely do need the peace that only God can give. And the only one that we can truly lean on for that peace is on the everlasting arms of Jesus. Amen? Amen. It goes on to say, Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. You see, these verses are showing a progression of that peace that God gives, even through tragedy. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arms. How many of us have been through such a great tragedy that nothing in this world can really give us comfort but we can only, we finally realize we can only find comfort in the arms of Jesus. And this is what this song is speaking about. How many of you knew that and understood that, that every time we sang it, that's what it meant, or that's where the song came from? You know, sometimes we don't take the due diligence to study what we actually know or learn or what we sing, and then we lose sight of why we sing it. And then we complain, well, I don't like these songs. They're old, they're, they're old-fashioned. They have no meaning anymore. Well, they don't have no meaning because we don't even know the meanings of them. And we forget and we neglect the true meaning behind these songs. Let's turn to our next verse. Hymn 216. Hymn 216. Hymn 216. And what's the hymn? When the roll is called up yonder. Now, for most people, you might not get it. Because this is more, this title is more old-fashioned. But hopefully with this song, you'll get it. When the roll is called up yonder. The calm assurance of a future heavenly home is one of the greatest blessings for every Christian. Amen? Amen. It has been said that the only... Those with an absolute confidence in their hereafter truly know how to live victorious in life. Having a personal relationship with Christ means that we will hear the trumpet call of God whether we are still alive or asleep in Jesus. James M. Black, who wrote this, was an active Methodist layman. 
a music teacher, and a composer and publisher of numerous gospel songs. This was his experience creating this song. While a teacher in a Sunday school at president of a, and president of a young people's society, I one day met a girl who was 14 years old. She was poorly clad and a child of a drunkard. She accepted my invitation to, a, to attend the Sunday school and to join young people's society. One evening at a consecration meeting, when members answered the roll call by repeating scripture texts, she failed to respond. I spoke of what a sad thing it would be when our names are called from the Lamb's Book of Life if one of us should be absent. When I reached my home, my wife saw that I was deeply troubled. Then the words in the first stanza came to me in full. In 15 minutes more, I had composed the other two verses. Going to the piano, I played the music just as it was found today in the hymn books. This is the sad part. The subsequent death of the missing girl from pneumonia after an illness of just 10 days furnished this dramatic finale to this account and gives a <clears throat> poignancy of the, of the roll call song. Since its publication in 1894, this simply worded with the rather ordinary music has compared, or excuse me, captured the hearts of innumerable believers, providing Christians with a singable, singable vehicle of praise for the glorious future that still awaits them. This young man, a teacher, was inviting this girl to accept Jesus. And when it came time, as it says, when the roll is called up yonder, when your name is called, when roll call is called, the sad truth is this girl did not accept. And through a battle of pneumonia, she died, as far as we know, in a lost condition. And it caused this man to think upon the decisions of people. For all of us here, we've all been in school Especially when our younger years, what is done at the beginning of class? Roll call. Are you here? Well, his message through this song was when Jesus does roll call, he doesn't think that young girl will be there. Even though he gave her the invitation to be there. So he made the song, when the roll is called up yonder, when your name is called by Jesus, will you be there? Will you be there to answer roll call? The song goes like this. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair, when the saved of earth shall gather, gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, says, I'll be there. How many of you want to be there when Jesus calls your name? Amen, Amen right? On that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his, of his resurrection share, when the chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies and the roll is called up yonder, says, I'll be there. Let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our, er and our work on earth is done and the roll is called up yonder, I hope you all will be there. That's my added ending. But he says, I'll be there. Truly, I know each and every one of us want to be there. But like that little girl, when an invitation is called, you have to answer and accept. You cannot wait to the last minute, although I know God allows that at times. But still, while we have the ability to choose now, we need to answer and say, yes, Lord, I am here. So that way, when the roll is called up yonder, you'll be there. Amen? Our next story is found in Hymn 
476. Him 476. The hymn is entitled, Burdens Are Lifted at Calvary. Notice even in these titles, they have messages of great victory through Jesus. Today's featured hymn was written in 1952. Actually, not that far apart. Many people think it's in the 16 or 1800s. This was written in 1952 by one of our contemporary songwriters, John M. Moore. He was a Baptist pastor and an evangelist in Toronto, Canada. The hymn was prompted by an experience that Dr. Moore had while serving as the assistant superintendent of Siemens Chapel in Glasgow, Scotland. He recalls this, and this was how he wrote the song. I wrote, Burdens are lifted at Calvary after a most interesting experience. The company's secretary of a large shipping firm telephoned the Siemens Chapel and requested that I visit a young merchant seaman who was lying critically ill in Glasgow Hospital. After getting permission from the nursing sister, I went in to visit the young sailor. I talked for a few moments, and then I put my hand in my case for a track, not knowing which one I would pull out. It happened to be a track based off Pilgrim's Progress, with a color reproduction of Pilgrim's coming to the cross with her great burden on his back. I showed the young seaman the picture. I told him of the story in brief, adding that Pilgrim's experience had been my experience too. I explained that when I came to the cross of Calvary, or excuse me, to the cross of Christ, my burden rolled away and my sense of sin and guilt before God was removed. He nodded his head when I asked him, do you feel this burden on your back today? He prayed together, never shall I forget, the smile of peace and assurance that lit up his face when he said that his burden was lifted. Later that night, sitting by the fireside and with a paper and pen, I could not get the thought out of my mind. His burden is lifted. I started writing, but never for a moment did I imagine that this little hymn would have become a favorite throughout the world. Since that time, I hear of people all over the world who are being blessed and saved through the singing of a hymn. This man visiting someone on his deathbed probably prayed with the gentleman, letting him know about the Savior, Jesus Christ. Possibly for the first time, and by his experience, by explaining to him about Christ, this man burdened that he had for who knows how long, says, came off. And this man's burden, whatever it was, inspired this pastor to write these words. Days are filled with sorrows and care. Hearts are lonely and drear. But burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. If you want, take some of these words and apply it to probably what that gentleman told him he was dealing with. Because this song is about that experience. Cast your care on Jesus today. Leave your worry and fear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Troubled soul, the Savior can see. Every heartache and tear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. How many times have we gone through that struggle and sang this song? How many times have we been through this struggle and the only one that could give us comfort was Jesus? Amen. I have a question. How many of you have a song for yourself that you sing when you're feeling down? Just a couple of you? The rest of you guys are always happy, right? Everything's always going good. I would encourage you, get a song. Have you ever heard that song, He's Able? I won't sing it because I'm a horrible singer, but if you ever find that song, He's Able, whenever I'm down and depressed, I sing that song. I learned it when I was at AFCO, and I was going through some things. One of my friends was next door in his room. He, he's, a, he's a tall Tongan. 
He's like six five, six six, makes me look tiny. And he was singing his his, his room, and those Tongans and Samoans have wonderful, beautiful voices. And he's singing that song. And me still being a new Christian, I'm like, what is that song? Never heard that before. He brought happiness to me when I was listening to him next door. And guess what? He taught me the song. And ever since then, I've never forgotten that song. And sometimes when I'm depressed or I'm going through issues, I have problems at work, whatever, I sing the song and immediately it cheers me up. Why? Because Jesus is in that song. His promises are in that song. He's going to lift me up. He's able to conquer anything that I go through. He's able to set me free. Get a song. Open up a hymn book. Find one of your favorites. It will cheer you up in the time of gloom and doom. It will cheer you up when you need Jesus most. Because not only do we praise God by scripture, but we praise God how? Through song and singing. Our next one we find is hymn number 530. We have two more left. Hymn number 530. And this hymn is entitled, It is Well with My Soul. Inner peace through an implicit trust in the love of God is the real evidence of a mature Christian faith. I love that. Let me read that. Inner peace through an implicit trust in the love of God is real evidence of of a mature Christian faith. Only with this kind of confidence in, his, in the Heavenly Father could Horatio Spatford experience such heart-changing tragedies as he did and yet be able to say, it is well with my soul. This is this man's experience. Horatio Spatford had known peaceful and happy days as a successful attorney in Chicago. He was the father of four daughters, an active member of the Presbyterian Church, and a loyal friend and supporter of D.L. Moody. Has anybody heard about D.L. Moody? He was a contemporary of Ellen White. Even Ellen White praised a lot of the things that he did during her time. She has great respect, talks a lot of good things about D.L. Moody. And other evangelical leaders of his day, then a series of calamities begin, starting with the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. Does anyone remember that? Okay, for those of you who raised your hand, you weren't born yet, so you don't remember that. I just, just wanted to throw that out of there. Okay, so <laughs> it started with the Great Chicago Fire of 1871, which wiped out the family's extensive real estate investments. When Mr. Moody and his music associate Ira Sankey left for Great Britain for an evangel evangelicalistic campaign. Spafford decided to lift the spirits of, of his family by taking them on a vacation to Europe. He also planned to assist in the Moody Sankey meetings there. So in November 1873, Spafford was detained by urgent business, but he sent his wife and his four daughters as scheduled on the SS Vial, I won't say the rest because I can't pronounce it, planning to join them soon. Halfway across the Atlantic, the ship was, was struck by an English vessel and sank in 12 minutes. All four of Spafford's daughters, Tanita, Maggie, Annie, and Bessie, were among the 226 who drowned. Miss Spafford was among the few who were miraculously saved. So his four daughters drowned, but his wife survived. Horatio Spafford stood hour after hour on the deck of the ship, carrying him to rejoin his sorrowing wife in Cardiff, Wales. When the ship, when the ship passed the approximate place where his precious daughters had drowned, Spafford received, received sustaining comfort from God that enabled him to write this. When sorrows like the bee silos roll, it is well with my soul. Whenever you sang this song, it is well with my soul. Did you know when he talks about when the sea bellows roll, what he was talking about? He's talking about when he's on the ship, the proximate place where his daughters drown. What do ships do in water? Sway. 
when C. Bellows rolled. And at that very moment that he passed over where his daughters drowned, what did he say? It is well with my soul. Why? The comfort knowing that God's there with him. That God will take care of him regardless of any circumstance. You could say in a sense he's going through a Job experience. This is a song. Now that you know the story, maybe some of the words will make sense. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea bellows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Is that not what Job was saying to God as well? Whatever happens to me in my life, that's okay, because I know you're in control. Same experience. Though sayings should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend, even so it is well with my soul. Talking in the beginning in the first stanza about his tragedy and ending with what? The second coming of Christ when what happens? Those who are dead in their graves are awake again to meet Jesus in the air. What is he looking forward to? The second coming and seeing who? His daughters rise when Jesus calls. When you, I hope when you hear these hymns again and you sing them, you'll have a better understanding. Our last hymn is hymn number 524. Hymn 524. And it's entitled, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Out of one of the darkest hours of her life, the tragic drowning of her husband, a young mother proclaimed through her tears, Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. And I know that thou art with me and will be with me till the end. Louisa M. R. Steed is the author of Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Her husband and her little daughter were enjoying an oceanside picnic one day. A drowning boy cried for help. Mr. Steed rushed to save him, but was pulled under by the terrified boy. Both drowned as Louisa and her daughter watched helplessly. During the sorrowful days that followed, the words of this hymn came from a grief-stricken wife's heart. Soon after this, Mrs. Steed and her daughter left for missionary work in South Africa. After more than 25 years of fruitful service, Louisa was forced to retire because of ill health. She died a few, few years later in southern Rhodesia. Her fellow missionaries had always loved Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus and wrote this tribute after her death. We miss her very much, but her influence on on excuse me, but her influence goes on as our 5,000 native Christians const continually sing the hymn in their native language, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Out of a deep human tragedy early in her life, Louisa Steed learned simply to trust in her Lord. She was used to praise of his glory for the remainder of her life, and still today her ministry continues each time we sing and apply the truth of these words. And her daughter, I forget her daughter's name, actually continues as a missionary in that same area where her mother started. And they constantly, every time they have worship service, was seeing a tribute to her because she taught them to learn about Jesus, then no matter, regardless of what happens in your life, it's sweet to trust in Jesus. Amen. They sing it as a tribute to her because she taught them the most important thing they could ever learn. And that is getting to know Jesus Amen. and trusting in him. Here are the words to this song. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know 
Thus saith the Lord. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing, cleansing flood. Yes, tis sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to seize, just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. I'm so glad I learned to trust thee, precious Jesus, Savior and friend. And I know that thou art with me, wilt be with me to the end. Amen. 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 When we sing these songs, let us just not think of them as songs that we sing for worship, but let us understand the true meaning of what each song was made for. That's uplifting Christ, not as today's music is, uplifting self. These songs were to lead us to Jesus. In the devotional, The Faith I Live By, chapter 236, entitled August 24th, Ellen White says this, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, seeking and making melody in your heart to the Lord, that's found in Ephesians 5.19, the melody of praise is the atmosphere of heaven. Think upon that. The melody of of praise when you sing is the atmosphere of heaven and when heaven comes in touch with earth there is music and song those in heaven join with angelic choir in their anthem of praise must learn on earth the song of heaven the keynote which is thanksgiving what does she say we must learn through praise of singing Giving thanksgiving. What did I tell you to remember in the beginning? What was our scripture verse? Psalm 69 verse 30. I will praise the name of God with song. And I will magnify him with thanksgiving. Praise God. Let us close with the word of prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, I just pray that as we learn the simple stories in regards to why these hymns were created. And why it is we sing them during our service. I know at times we may have arguments. I know at times we may have differences. But Heavenly Father, whatever music or whatever song it is that we use during our service, may it be a song that glorifies you and your son. May that song fill this place or whatever place that we are at and create an atmosphere, Sister White talks about, that like heaven is right here. We just ask, Heavenly Father, that when we do these things, that we ask your presence. We praise you. And we thank you for giving us the ability to praise you through music, praise you through song. <clears throat> may we, as we decide in the future what is right, may we look at these things and only ask the one question. Does this song, does this music lead me to Jesus? And if it does, I pray that you will give us that wisdom on how to use it. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this wonderful Sabbath day. We thank you for everyone here. We thank you for giving us these messages of hope through song. And we praise you and give you all thanks that we can give. And we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to end with the closing hymn of hymn 245. Hymn 245.